Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. It is my privilege to serve as host this evening. I would like to thank Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Pam Schaffler, Chair of our Board of Trustees, all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors for making the work of New York Historical happen with your continued and committed support. Now, it's been a thrill for me to shepherd over the planning and implementation of our Center for Women's History. In only a few short years, we've been able to accomplish so much in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions. Since 2017, the Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery has been the venue for no fewer than nine important shows that foreground women's critical role in American history, including our current exhibition, Cover Story, Catherine Graham, CEO, that's been many years in the making. I am so proud to have led the curatorial team that has pulled off this remarkable feat. But now to our program. The Barbizon, the hotel that set women free, will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you in the audience can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. The chat function has been disabled, so please do make sure to use Q&A. After the presentation, we'll get to as many questions as time allows. And now I'd like to introduce the author of today's featured book. Paulina Bren is an award-winning writer and historian who teaches at Vassar College. She attended Wesleyan University as an undergraduate, later receiving an MA in International Studies from the University of Washington and a PhD in History from New York University. She's held a host of research grants and fellowships, including residencies in Berlin, Vienna, Budapest, and Atlanta. Her most recent book, the Barbizon, The Hotel That Set Women Free, is a New York Times editor's choice and has received international press coverage with reviews in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The Guardian's Sunday Observer, and The London, London Times, among many others. In addition, Paulina is a well-known scholar of everyday life and communism behind the Iron Curtain, starting with her groundbreaking book, The Greengrocer and His TV, The Culture of Communism After the 1968 Prague Spring, which originated a new field of study. Welcome, Paulina. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to have you and to discuss your book, The Barbizon, The Hotel That Set Women Free. It's so many things. Well, it's the story of a place, the Barbizon Hotel for Women. It's also a wonderful narrative that interweaves the history of New York City and the history of the United States in the 20th century with a nuanced history of women and the businesses and professions that supported them. Uh, I'm, as a scholar and a historian myself, I am so curious about your own scholarly process. Where in the world did you begin? Well, I usually begin with panic and dread. And I only <laughs> say that half jokingly. Um, I've, I've realized I, well, first of all, I'm interested in topics that haven't been written about before. So thus there is, really not that much to read in order to get started. And that's very daunting. Also, I, I'm always more interested in sort of a collective experience about a time and a place. So again, I, I don't follow an individual biography. So it's not an opportunity to go into archives and just follow one person's story. So thus the panic and dread. Um, and this, is, this was certainly the case with the Barbizon when I started. I thought, well, this is great, famous hotel. Um, there's going to be, there are going to be many sources. Uh, not at all, it turned out. People had tried to write this book before and they had stopped for a very good reason. And uh, interestingly, since we're with the New York Historical Society this evening, uh, my first stop was the New York Historical Society where you have a wonderful archive of New York hotels. But for reasons that I can only speculate about, um, the folder on the Barbizon is very, very thin. There's, and it's, it's illustrative of the general sort of landscape of sources available for the Barbizon. So this was really about finding different avenues to get at the story of the Barbizon and literally sort of building it back up brick by brick. 
Uh, it's almost as if that that those lack of sources gave you a much more multi-dimensional approach to to that larger story, and uh, and that gives I think the narrative quite a bit of vitality as well. So you That's made a generous uh, way of thinking. Oh no, about the lack absolutely. Of sources. But I think yeah. no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and when I look back, even on sort of the more academic books I've written about communism in everyday life, the Barbizon and the book that I've just started working on for my next book, um, it. It really is, it, it, this is what interests me of how you can put together a multifaceted story. And that does mean multifaceted um, sources and a creative way of thinking about sources, absolutely. Definitely. So the Barbizon Hotel, it wasn't just a safe and respectable place where single women lived, but it was also a, a, a kind of nexus for various institutions that sustained these women. Uh, providing them with more career and life choices than than ever before. So your book is also really about these training grounds like Katie Gibbs Secretarial School, Mademoiselle Magazine, the sort of modeling agencies. So talk to us about them. How did they provide security for women and how did it change from the late 20s through the late 70s and early 80s? Absolutely. Um, I hadn't thought about them as training grants, but you're right. Um, and, and they were sort of these rare access points uh, for women to find independence. And so it really does begin with the Barbizon Hotel. As you said, this was a place of respectability and respectability, which of course went out of fashion in the 1970s and we can talk about sort of that arc. Um, but respectability in the 1920s and 1930s and 40s and 50s was what would give you independence. And so it really was the Barbizon Hotel being a place such as this. I mean, certainly a place of whiteness, which we can also discuss, um, but it was a place of respectability and that garnered that freedom, that independence for women. And then, as you say, there were these, these other sort of pockets through which the women who arrived at the Barbizon could seek careers, could seek different ways of envisioning their lives. One of the ones was the Katie Gibbs Secretarial School. Now, back in the 1980s, I remember uh, the, the Gibbs School already seemed a sort of outdated idea, the idea that we train women as secretaries. And so it was fascinating to discover this rich history of Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School, which was really a phenomenon of the 20th century and became particularly important after um, the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. And so there, there were other secretarial schools that, that women were attending. But Catherine Gibbs, this is a woman, Catherine Gibbs, she became a widow in the early 1900s, had to find a way to make a living for her kids and her sister. Um, and she turned out to be a great marketing person. She opened this school and she advertised as a very posh secretarial school. Well, when the, when the Great Depression hit and, and the stock market fell, um, these women, these elite women from elite colleges with degrees in English literature, they suddenly needed to make a living. And Catherine Gibbs was the way to do it. So that was really important. Um, another important um, sort of avenue was modeling, which again, we might think, oh, grown, um, but that's exactly the point that with the Great Depression, um, women who were working were seen as pariahs. They were taking men uh, jobs away from men. So logically, they were safer by taking on women's work if they were going to work outside of the home. And so now we have residents at the Barbizon Hotel who are certainly Catherine Gibbs secretarial students. In fact, Catherine Gibbs takes over two floors and then three floors as a dorm within the hotel for them but the Powers Modeling Agency, the first modeling agency. And he brings in uh, women, young women from, from, to a large extent from the Midwest. And, and the Barbizon Hotel is a New York hotel, but it's about, it's a very American story because the women who stay there are not New Yorkers. They become New Yorkers to some extent, um, but they are from small town America. And Powers Modeling Agency also, sort of caters to this sort of, th these are their models and the look that they're going for, sort of all American blonde and so forth. And they stay, they also stay at the Barbizon. This segues into the forties and fifties where Eileen Ford becomes the big agency, being a female run agency. 
And also she sends her models over there. And then a really interesting um, sort of connection for me while I was doing research, a real entry point for me as a scholar, and also an entry point to the Barbizon for women was Mademoiselle magazine, which again, in the 80s, I remember Mademoiselle magazine um, as sort of a really not very good uh, sort of teen fashion magazine. But again, it has this remarkable history. It was, um, it started in the mid 1930s, run by a woman. Um, it was known as the Bible for every college girl, because this is where you learn not only what to wear and what to talk about, but what to read. It ran some of the most incredible, Truman Capote's first story was in Mademoiselle magazine. And in the early 1940s, uh, Mademoiselle magazine started this guest editor program. And it was a way basically to bring in the creme de la creme of, of, of young women across America who want to be writers, artists, and so forth, bring them in for June and have them stay at the Barbizon. So this, you know, there were all these different, exactly as you say, these training grounds, these different um, sort of organizations and that, that in many ways were doing what the Barbizon was, was also trying to do. And also sort of, but caught up with the complexity of, of course, being very feminized places, feminized occupations and so forth. So it was, it was complex. Um, but fascinating stories behind all of these entry points. So it seems these, the women were testing out professional identities, uh, which were uh, brand new in, in many ways. And the Barbizon was, was that nexus. Uh, but we call these women the new woman and uh, she certainly evolves uh, throughout the decades uh, of your story. Tell us, tell us a bit about how that happens from the twenties till the seventies, eighties. Absolutely. Um, this was this was really fascinating to me too, um, because by looking at the hotel and looking at New York uh, through the course of the 20th century, we sort of get a different sense of of this new woman, right, of of the modern era. Um, so, in the 1920s, when this hotel, when the Barbizon was built, it opened its doors in 1928. And the thing is that it was not the only women's hotel being built at this time. Um, there was a whole spate of them in the 1920s because suddenly women were liberated through World War I. They were actually liberated through the, the pandemic of the 1920s, the Spanish flu um, in many ways. Um, and they were coming to New York to, to now try out these new lives that they were being allowed to live. And they didn't want to stay in boarding houses. They were considered old fashioned, musty, sort of revolting. And also they were, they were often connected with religious organizations. And these were modern women who wanted to live modern lives. Um, and these hotels, these residential hotels, which were all about sort of an opulent exterior and opulent interior in terms of common rooms, but with small actual bedrooms. Um, so these had been, around for a few decades, a couple of decades for men and women wanted the same and the same developers, they saw a new consumer. And so they started to build these. And in fact, these hotels were book solid before they were built. That was how huge the demand was for them. And one of the key things was that they would have no kitchens. Now they didn't have kitchens because of a law that actually made it easier to build these places, but the Barbizon marketed the notion of not having a kitchen as fundamental to its identity and to the identity of the women who were coming, which was that if you did not have to cook, meaning you also did not have to take care of a household, then you could live the life that you wanted to. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and, but at the same time, when it, was, when it opened its doors in 1928, it, it had suddenly this modern twist, this feminist twist without realizing maybe so much it was a feminist twist. I think to some extent, um, but certainly it had this veneer of being a very elite place. What happened then, because the crash happened a year after it opened its doors, the Barbizon continued to advertise itself as a place that was, that was a safe haven for sort of elite, respectable um, young women on the go, 
um, society young women to a certain extent. It continued to advertise that way, but it actually pivoted. And that's why it survived. It pivoted. And that was what was so interesting is looking at the women who stayed there, the socioeconomic diversity. As I say, we can talk about racial diversity, but certainly that did not happen until uh, the 1950s, I discovered. Um, but the socioeconomic economic diversity happened very quickly. Um, and that's one of the fascinating things to me, how the women ranged from, from debutantes to really women who'd run away from home in rural Ohio. And they were living next door to each other now. And that in itself, I think, is, is, is very interesting. Um, and then um, the 1940s, um, in terms of this new woman, as I say, really, when these guest editors started to come in, um, it, it certainly also impacted in terms of sort of its intellectual cachet and its place in New York, in a sort of a New York intellectual society. And then the 1950s, this new woman, particularly fascinating because this is the decade where um, the, the Barbizon is nicknamed the doll's house because of all these models. I mean, this is when Grace Kelly is here, is, is Sylvia Plath and so forth. Many actresses in the late 1940s, early 1950s are at the Barbizon. Um, but they are, they, yes, it's a doll's house. It's, the, the Barbizon is now a place where it's famous because these beautiful young women that men hang around, Salinger hangs around at the coffee shop trying to pick up women pretending he's a Canadian hockey player. Um, I mean, there is all of this, absolutely. But it's so interesting when you dig into sort of the, the young lives of these later famous women, the kind of conflict they feel, the way that sexuality plays into this era, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So the new woman really has many phases throughout the hotel's history. Particularly when, when one considers, uh, say, Ladies Mile in, in, in New York City in the 19th century, this was empowering for women because they could actually be out and about by themselves. I mean, just as the precursor to the new woman was a woman who couldn't even go out on chaperone. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's groundbreaking. In yeah, fact. And absolutely. The, and I think, place, you know. I'm sorry. Yeah, and absolutely. And I think you're, you're right to point to that. And I think we forget that. And um, Plath, in her um, letters, sort of in, in her letters home while she was at the Barbizon in June, 1953, she lamented quite a bit um, about how she hadn't found a date, a boyfriend. Part of it was she was boy crazy, but, but honestly, another part of it was that um, as you're saying, even though things had, had um, progressed, you, as a young woman in the 1950s, you were privy to a very different New York if you had a date next to you. You could go to places with a young man as an escort that you couldn't go to by yourself or with your girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So Plath's lament was also really grounded in, in experiential facts. Indeed, uh, indeed. And uh, this sort of leads to my, my next question. Uh, uh, there, there are a few types that we see in your book from, from, as you say, the homegrown beauty queen to the ambitious girl seeking independence, adventure, in New York City. But, but I'm most fascinated by the highly educated women of the Seven Sisters and other colleges. Uh, of course, times changed drastically from the roaring 20s to the 60s. But, but why was it that most of these women consistently chose to subject themselves to the mind-numbing phenomenon of housewife dumb. You know, you write, uh, the dollhouse was merely an interlude in a young woman's journey toward the end goal to become mistress of her own home. Why go to college if that's what your aspirations are? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and this was very much the 1950s. This was the dollhouse era. Um, why? Well, I think sort of a basic answer of course would be societal pressure and social pressure, they're not exactly the same, has always and continues to more directly um, affect women than men. Uh, we can talk about the toxicity of masculinity that men, you know, it's difficult, men are not allowed to cry, not allowed to feel, it's damaging, it's all true. But the social pressures 
that women um, encounter are often lead to a lack of access, therefore. In other words, masculinity does not block doors, um, but the social pressures of what it is to be a woman at a certain time does. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that plays a big part of it. Um, and it, it, it is interesting because in fact, um, because of this housewifedom that reigned supreme in the 1950s, um, there, there was a whole series of presidents of women's colleges particularly who had to make speeches trying to explain and justify why women even needed to have an education if they weren't going to use it. I mean, it actually became sort of a national crisis of why are we sending these women to college? So the, the convoluted argument became, well, because an educated woman can educate her own children. So that's that's the that's the usage. That you, but that's that's well, like Republican motherhood from the the eighteen uh, the eighteenth century, which yeah, is uh, exactly. not too much progress when you come exactly to it. Or, no it was, it was it was shocking. And also, of course, what plays into this, of course, is not is not only the consumer prosperity of the post-war era, which of course allows men <laughs> to patriarchal structures to say, oh, you, we can afford it, you, can, you don't have to work, right? So there is that, but also the Cold War. Um, we should not underestimate that women who were single, who were working, um, during the Cold War was seen as suspicious. That played into it too. Um, it was interesting to read, uh, looking at the red sort of the phenomenon of the Red Scare and, and how, for example, Mademoiselle Magazine, which was a hotbed of liberal women, except for the, for the editor in chief, she was a conservative Republican, but um, it was a hotbed of liberal women all just working among other women. So all these women places were particularly targeted and women were seen as very vulnerable to the propaganda of the Cold War. And, and of course, and, and it being the 1950s, I will again return to the question of, of sex and sexuality um, where in terms of this, this the, the pressures, I mean, Plath, Plath's diaries are all about sort of her sexual desire and her anger over not being able to, not being allowed to express it and that men could do whatever they wanted to. They did not have to rein in their desires. And what was really interesting to me when, when I was doing the research, I found that in 1953 in June, when uh, Sylvia Plath was at, at the Barbizon and at Mademoiselle in New York, um, that was the same month that the Kinsey report on female sexuality came out. And uh, Sylvia Plath and her cohorts, which included the novelist Diane Johnson, the author of Le Divorce and those other wonderful novels, and also Janet Barraway, another writer. So they were all called in one afternoon and they, was, they were told, well, we're thinking of publishing a report about the Kinsey report we're all gonna give you a copy of that right now. You have to go to your corners, you mustn't speak to each other and you have to write what you think about it. And some of the women were very honest. They said, well, you know, it's, it's all about the orgasm and yet nobody explains it to us and others, you know, they were being really quite quite specific and, and very, very vulnerable in their answers. And Plath, who was always talking about this in her diaries, had the most sort of expressionless response to the Kinsey report. And I really think that in many ways she is so sim sort of symbolic of the 1950s because of, of she, she hated the fact that she was giving in to the social pressure and yet she couldn't help herself. And it was tearing her apart and you can see that. Yeah. Uh, so there, there was a definite disconnect between women's sexual desires and society's expectations of them in this period. Um, you know, beyond plot, we know what happened to Plath, but, but how did these inconsistencies plague and torture you know, the women of the Barbizon, the dolls of the dollhouse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So of course, so you know, I talk, I talk about Plath, but um, I also have a chapter on the lone women 
uh, the women who came to the Barbizon and sort of the Barbizon was a launching pad. You went there because you dreamt of things and it was, it was the place that you were going to become what you dreamt of. But of course there were so many women who came and, and it wasn't what they hoped um, for, for various reasons. And I, and I have a whole chapter about them. And when I, what I find interesting there in terms of this whole question of, about sexuality and the way it's sort of repressed but also weaponized is how much it was a part of their lives. These, these women who were not at the center of attention, who you could say were quite ordinary women, um, but they, for example, I, I interviewed um, models who, who were at the Barbizon who said they always had women coming to their door to see if they could get a double date, if they could bring another man. Now, it wasn't just about going on a date. It was about the fact that a lot of these women didn't have that much money for a nice dinner other than saltines out of the box. And a date meant food. I said before a date meant also, you know, seeing a, a more exciting New York. Yes, but it also often meant having a nice dinner, having a meal, a warm meal. Um, and you sort of had to bargain yourself for that, right? Um, so it was, and, and the sell by date was, was again, so it's, even for the women who went there to make some of, them, of themselves and did, they understood that even so, marriage had to be the end point. And, sort of and an yeah. economic contract almost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And for a lot of these small town uh, women, it was one thing for the debutantes, they were always in a milieu where they could meet the right kind of men. But for these young women from Ohio who were going to be models for just a few years in New York, this was their window. They were not going to meet anybody, at the, you know, at the non-existent country club in Ohio. So it, it was very transactional at the same time that it was repressed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, I love reading about the uh, Grace Kelly and Sylvia Plath, Joan Didion, Liza Minnelli, and on and on. But but um, I also love reading about these sort of anonymous, non-famous people, residents of the Barbizon. Um, why did they choose to remain in New York over returning home where they might have had greater security? Uh, it's a dangerous world out there in New York City at this time and an expensive they were, Well, they were in the, in, <laughs> in the well-protected Barbizon. I mean, I should say for anybody who hasn't read the book, I mean, the Barbizon was a women's residential hotel. No men were allowed beyond the lobby. Um, and you know, of course, therefore, there were many men who, who claimed that they had made it up the stairs to the bedroom area. Um, wonderful wild tales of that. Um, it's hard to say who actually managed. Um, certainly, the, the front desk, May Sibley at the front desk, was constantly having to wave away men who came in uh, dressed as various um, sort of professionals, particularly doctors or <laughs> gynecologists on the whole. Um, so they would exactly they would come in their in their green, you know, medical um, suits and so forth, and she would send them away. Um, so it it was very protected. Um, but why they stayed, it's it's hard to say. Obviously, it's an individual, you know, case by case basis. But I would say, you know, the meaning of success, in many ways, just getting oneself to New York, getting a room of one's own in New York is success and and so i you know hats off to them and of course as the hotel then started on its reincarnations in the 1980s in 1981 out of economic necessity it had to open its doors to men and then it was two decades of the barbers on trying to re-envision itself as a hotel um, spectacularly and yet failingly every single time. These women who, when this process started, there were about 156 of them, there are five remaining today. Um, these women got themselves a really good tenant lawyer, discovered, or it was the lawyer ensured that their rooms were actually considered rent control rooms with rent control 
um, rents. And so as the hotel, I mean, it's fascinating because as the hotel was refurbished, behind a hidden wall on each floor, the, the original rooms of the Barbizon with the original women remained for many decades. And when it was finally turned into condo, luxury condo, build, luxury condo building in, in uh, the early 2000s, or 2005, um, they completely, the, I mean, the hotel was completely regutted inside. It has no resemblance to what it looked like before it turned into enormous luxury apartments. Um, but there was a floor built with small studio, one bedroom, lush, plush apartments, and the remaining five women lived there. So, you know, how do we judge success? I think in terms of a New York story, <laughs> which <laughs> New York stories are about real estate in so many ways, um, I, they, they ended up, in my book, being a success, you know. It's funny, uh, only in New York City though, right? Could you live in an SRO and, and that's success. And actually. they get daily maid service still because that was the oh. original contract with the Barbizon. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, too bad, too bad. I can't get a room there. Um, no, tell me about it. I, actually, that, that does segue into our first question of the evening and, and it's a simple one. Where where exactly was the Barbizon located? Where, oh, um, sure, absolutely. So the Barbizon was on 63rd, at, or is still, it's called Barbizon, um, you know, now the condo, but it's, yeah, 63rd and Lexington Avenue. Yes, um, sort of beautifully centrally located uh, near everything. Well, it's, it's interesting, it was, it was centrally located, but certainly um, when, but it, it was sort of a bit of a, boring uh, sort of desolate Irish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And what really changed things up was uh, Malachi McCourt, um, the brother of, of the famous Frank McCourt of Angela's Ashes, who himself is a wonderful writer um, and an amazing raconteur. And he's just, he's, he's remarkable. And he opened a bar um, called Malachi's two blocks away from the Barbizon. And it was sort of the first singles bar in New York. And it was obviously a magnet for all the women staying at the Barbizon. Um, and that really, Malachi's just sort of changed the social landscape of the Upper East Side for, for these young women. That's fun. <laughs> um, so so uh, one of our viewers is wondering if there are any depictions of the Barbizon or the new woman in popular culture at the time or or later in movies or stories or novels or whatever? Yes, I mean, obviously, so so Sylvia Plath wrote The Bell Jar um, mm. and it is literally about her experience at the Barbizon and Mademoiselle in 1953. Now, literary scholars, I think they're sort of, they're careful about saying that it's, um, it's, I mean, everybody knows it's biographical, but to what extent, right? Well, I would say to an, extreme extent it's biographical having spoken to a lot of the women who were there with her um really what she recounts i mean the the barbazon is the amazon she becomes esther she um sort of turns the the 20 guest editors to into i think 12 um but everything that happens there really did happen um, including her famously throwing her, her entire wardrobe off the roof of the hotel on the last night that she was there, and then going home, um, having a breakdown, and her first, as we know at least, her first suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it was triggered by her experience at the Barbizon and Mademoiselle. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I would say, is the closest depiction. Um, in the 1930s, um, there were a few movies based on women's hotels where actually the writers would go to the, to, you know, uh, to, to the Barbizon to, to experience it and then to write about it. Um, and then I don't know if any of you remember, I don't mention this in the book, but um, the, the sitcom in the 80s or 90s, 90s called Bosom Buddies with Tom Hanks, yeah. that was based around this idea of 
a few remaining women's hotels at that time. And of course it was a cheap way to live. And so they pretend they dress up as women to live in this women's only hotel. And I should say there's one remaining one called the Webster Apartments, which was uh, built in the 1930s for employees of Macy's by one of the founders of Macy's. And um, you can still get a room there as, as a woman and it's still relatively affordable and quite similar, I have to say, in terms of sort of rules, regulations, which of course is not that appealing to many young women today. <laughs> not at all, but I, I actually, you alluded to this a moment ago um, and I'm, I'm curious about how you went about locating your sources and speaking with them. What, what did that feel like? What was that experience like? Um, it was actually a wonderful experience um, once I located them. Um, it was the experience of meeting women in their 80s and 90s who were incredibly funny with remarkable memories, better than I've ever had. Um, and, and also storytellers. This was, a, the, when they were at the Barbizon, this was a moment in their lives where precisely as we've talked about, it's this short little window of, of real independence and excitement and singledom um, and so they recalled it very, very well. Um, so I have to say that was, that was probably my greatest delight. Um, in terms of locating those sources, um, it really, the, the connection between Mademoiselle and Barbizon was incredibly helpful. Um, I discovered that Betsy Talbot Blackwell, who is the editor in chief of Mademoiselle magazine, I could write a whole book about her, I mean, remarkable person. Um, so her files, but really office files are at an archive in Laramie, Wyoming. And that was very helpful in terms of, it was, it's disorganized and it was about going through thousands and thousands of memos. And there were two things I, two key things that I sort of found because of that, that were really important to me. One was Plath and her cohorts, uh, writing about the Kinsey report, which I know no Plath scholar has, has found before. Um, but the other thing more important to me was how this, this whole question of how to write about a hotel and the women there when there are no sources. That means there are no, no guest registries. There are no floor plans. I sort of found a floor plan that somebody gave me, gave me a little sense of it, but no guest registries, no, no letters of introduction. I mean, not, none, of the, none of the things you'd expect, no, no employee records, nothing like that. And it's really important when you're writing a history that spans the 20th century, where it's a hotel that's built in the 1920s, obviously for white women, but then, you know, when, when do women of color, when, when, does the first black woman get to stay there? Does she even want to stay there, right? Um, so that was really important to answer. And I was so happy about this, that going through these memos, um, I found this um, really sort of animated um, back and forth conversation through memo, office memos at Mademoiselle in 1956 about a woman that they wanted to pick um, for the guest editor program that summer. She was by far the best artist. She was an amazing student. She was attractive. The only problem was she was black. And they were going back and forth. The business side of Mademoiselle was furious. And they were saying, why do you, all you editors, you have to keep doing everything for a first. Like you need to be first in everything. We don't need this. We're gonna lose customers. We're gonna use, lose readers. We're going to lose everybody. And actually the, the very conservative Betsy Talbot Blackwell said, no, no, that's it, she's coming. And the big question was, will the Barbizon even let her in? Well, they let her in. I spoke with her, she's amazing. She became a famous um, artist and rod, writer, Barbara Chase Rabot. Um, and, and so through that, I was able to sort of find something. It doesn't mean that there was a floodgate, you know, of diversity at the Barbizon after 1956, but it allows me to tell a fuller story. So this was, I mean, that was, that was a godsend that I found those memos and found that particular conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in an unexpected place as well, I would think. Yeah. That's kind of usually the way it works, I find. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that process of discovery is so exciting. Um, 
Um, but talk a little bit more about how you mentioned that the whiteness is a critical dynamic uh, at the Barbizon. Um, uh, you know, apart from this one story you just told us, how does that, it doesn't open up the floodgates, but how do things start shifting from a racial perspective? Yeah, um, I mean, I think, also with the with I should say with the Great Depression, you know, in I talk about at the start of the book, I talk about flappers. Um, the unsinkable Molly Brown, survivor of the Titanic, is sort of the first famous um, resident at the very beginning. And she's on in her years and she dies at the Barbizon, uh, but she's surrounded by flappers whom she hates, even though she does relate to them in many ways. Well, when we were talking about the flappers, I mean black women were flappers as well in the 1920s. Um, but in the same way that, that all these ambitious uh, women's sort of plans took a nosedive with the Great Depression, even more so in the case of Black women. I talk about that in the book. Um, so that takes place. Now, as I say, the entry of Barbara Chase Rabot, who's not told where the swimming pool is, but she's let in and she had, she felt, I mean, it's also a personality, but she felt she was absolutely fine at the Barbizon while she was there. Um, and then one of the delights of writing this book is the sort of the, the mail, the fan mail and the, the, the emails I've, I've received. And early on, I received a really interesting one. And it was, it was one of those where you're like, where were you when I was writing this? Um, but I knew that was going to happen. Um, and a woman wrote who's actually friends with Barbara Chase. And she lived at the hotel from about 1970 to 1972. So quite a bit later. And she said that, she, that it, what I sort of write about in the book um, in terms of how Barbara Chase, you know, fits in even as society maybe says she doesn't, is she has a particular sort of attitude. Um, and, and her friend who, who's also a black woman said, who was there for two years in the early seventies and said, this was absolutely true. I mean, yes, you had, of course, racism all around you, but she, she felt comfortable at the Barbizon because she had a particular point of view about herself as a woman. And that, she said, made her fit in, made her feel comfortable at the Barbizon. So obviously, you know, these questions are, are complex. And, and in my chapter on lone women, there are all these white women who felt incredibly uncomfortable there. Um, so it's hard to say, but certainly it was, the Barbizon was a white institution, had obviously been set up as one, uh, being built in the 1920s, but then was of course in New York, which itself was changing. So the question is, how does it go? And I think there's an added complexity in that sort of who was in and who was out at the Barbizon sort of cut beyond just socio socioeconomics and race. Yeah, absolutely, and um, that uh, sort of segues into this kind of trick question which we just received. Can you describe the culture of the hotel? Um, there, were, there were, as I say, many levels um, of that culture and the coffee shop was a place to sort of see that culture take place. And, you know, there's an element of the high school cafeteria, I have, I have, to, I have to think, um, right. where there, there were the young, beautiful women just running in on their, you know, clippy floppy heels and, and, um, and they were off to their rehearsals on their Broadway shows and to their photo shoots um, and life was just wonderful. Um, then there were the women who were sort of on the outskirts of the coffee shop, um, not in groups by themselves, reading, um, sort of wondering what they're going to do. I mean, the culture was in that sense, social culture was very mixed, but I'd say in terms of culture, what, it was a culture of female ambition. And this is, this is the thing that's been really interesting to me that, that, I'd say this book is a history of female ambition. And what I, what I learned is that it does not run on the same parallel track with the history of women's rights. Women were and always will be ambitious regardless of 
their access and their rights to be so. And so there are ways of trying to circumvent that. Doesn't mean you're going to succeed. It's a history of women trying to circumvent the restrictions that allow them to build on their ambition. Um, and that cuts across all sorts of, um, as I say, um, other, other lines of, of experience. Um, that really that ambition is, is central to the type of women who come to New York. And, and I, at this time to this place, and I have to say, I've been asked, do you wish a place like this existed? And I think it's difficult to imagine a place like this existing for a variety of reasons, which I could go into, but I won't. But I do think it's tremendous loss that there isn't a place that somebody who is not from New York, who doesn't know a soul, especially for a woman who is always vulnerable in a city, um, that there was a place that was affordable where they could get a room. Um, and that I think is important. That is something I think can only add to the larger culture of a city. Beautiful answer and it encapsulates uh, truly the crux of the, of the book and of your, your, um, your argument. But uh, beyond all of the wonderful research and, uh, and stories is some wonderful writing. And I was wondering if you would be so kind as to read us a passage from the book. I'll take this. <laughs> oh, goody, it's <laughs> very handy. <laughs> it's right behind me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let me see. I'll just, I'll just read the first two pages of the introduction, I guess. So who was the woman who stayed at New York's famous Barbizon Hotel? She could be from anywhere, just as likely from small town America as from across the George Washington Bridge. But more often than not, she arrived in a yellow checker cab because she didn't yet know how to use the New York subway. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> she had the address on a piece of paper in her hand and she carefully read it aloud to the taxi driver. The Barbizon Hotel, 140 East 63rd Street. But in all likelihood, the taxi driver knew where she was going even before she spoke. Perhaps he noticed how she timidly waved down his cab or how she tightly held onto the handle of her brown suitcase or how she wore her best clothes, this out of town girl newly arrived in Manhattan. The piece of paper was most probably crumpled by now or certainly worse for wear, having traveled with her by train, by bus, or even by plane, if she was lucky or well off, or if like Sylvia Plath and Joan did in, she was a Mademoiselle magazine contest winner. The rush of excitement when this young woman walked through the front doors of the Barbizon would be impossible to replicate later in life because of what it meant in that moment. She had made her escape from her hometown and all the expectations or none that came with it. She had left all that behind resolutely, often after months of pleading, saving, scrimping, plotting. She was here now in New York, ready to remake herself, to start an entirely new life. She had taken her fate into her own hands. Beautiful writing, beautiful narrative, a wonderful conversation but unfortunately we've run out of time. <laughs> I want to thank Paulina Bren for being with us today. Uh, and I wanna thank you and the audience for also being with us today and ask you to please sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons like this one. Paulina's book, The Barbizon, The Hotel That Set Women Free is now available online for purchase at our NY History store. Finally, the New York Historical Society is currently open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website. We hope to see you on Central Park West to view cover story, Catherine Graham, CEO, in our Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gallery. Thank you all again, and have a great night.